This is the Agoro Carbon Farming Podcast. Agoro Carbon Alliance is taking action on a global scale to reverse the effects of climate change by decarbonizing farming and restoring carbon to the world's soil. On this podcast, we're going to explore carbon farming from the soil to the atmosphere and how it affects everyone in between. To learn more, visit us at agorocarbonalliance.com. Welcome back to the Carbon Farming Podcast. In today's episode, we're diving into the world of soil health in agriculture, where farmers and ranchers operate on razor-thin margins. One of Agoro's team of scientists, Dr. John Shanahan, a seasoned expert from the Soil Health Institute, embarks on a groundbreaking journey to uncover the relationship between soil health practices and, more importantly, profitability. During his tenure at the, at the Soil Health Institute, John led a comprehensive survey of over 100 farmers across nine states, all to answer a pivotal question. Does soil health practices enhance or hinder profitability? Join us as John delves into those findings and unveils insights that shed light on this pivotal role of soil health in agriculture. John, thanks for joining us. Let's get this started with the big question. You know, farmers and ranchers, as we mentioned, run businesses with very tight margins. Uh, So profitability is often the most significant barrier to adopting some of these soil health practices. Is it possible to adopt these practices and still be profitable on the farm? So the short answer to that question, Scott, I think is yes. Uh, Maybe what we should do is just back up a little bit and give you a little bit of context of how we did this. Sure. It was really a fun and fascinating project that I did while I was with the Soil Health Institute. And so a little bit about the study. We recruited 100 growers, as, as you mentioned, across basically the Corn Belt from the north and south the margins of the Corn Belt to the east-west border of the Corn Belt. So pretty comprehen- comprehensive study of growers of corn and soybean, basically corn and soybean growers in that area. And so we had some criteria when we were recruiting these folks that we wanted these farmers to have adopted these practices for you know, a minimum of five years. And the reason for that is a lot of research has shown that you oftentimes don't see these benefits until you kind of get into the, the practices a little bit, a couple, three years. And so we were trying to select growers because we wanted to basically measure the, the, ben- the benefits associated with adopting the practices. So that was sort of the, uh, the criteria that we were looking for. We we went far and wide and found a lot of growers, older growers, younger growers. It was a nice diverse mix in terms of, of the de- demographics of the growers. So, and so a little bit about these growers, the, the, the average farm size was around 2,000 acres. So these were not hobby farmers. These were people that were implementing these practices on, on a large scale. Of those uh, 100 farmers, 85% of those acres were no-till and 53% of those acres were in, in cover cropping. So well above the national mm. average in terms of what they were doing on these on these operations. And also, most of these folks had been no-tilling for 20 years and, and probably uh, cover cropping for a, a minimum of like nine to 10 years. So they definitely had tried a lot of different things and and learned a lot. And, and one thing they, they mentioned is we didn't start out with all of our acres in these practices. They wanted to learn as they, as they adopted these practices. And there certainly were some learnings along the way. So, yeah, so that's a little bit about the study. Um, and and we so what we did is we asked these folks questions like to, to come up with a partial budget. So we asked them, what were you doing before you did no-till? What were you doing before you did cover cropping? And we asked them kind of questions like, what were the costs associated with making, with making those practice changes? Right. So that's really how our, I actually, I forgot to mention this. We did these interviews. It took us about two hours. And. And Archie Flanders, who's an ag economist with the Soil Health Institute, he was there with me. We were conducting these interviews during COVID time, so they were all they were all on the, the remote side of things. Um, yeah, but it was still. I mean, I think we really get, learned a lot through these through these uh, interview processes. And yeah, w- there's a lot of details I'm we can share here in terms of that question that you just asked here earlier. Did you ever come across someone you were interviewing that said it wasn't worth the cost? I put all this money into it right. and it's just a money pit and I, and I've never seen a benefit, yeah. you know, and we did ask that question of almost all of them. Uh huh. And, 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 and I think what really kind of stood out as well, if they had been doing these practices for the number of years that we talked about, 
and they were losing money in, I'm pretty sure their banker wouldn't have allowed them to do it. Right. Yeah, they, they, it, it, <laughs> right. Wouldn't, it wouldn't have gone forward. So now they did, of course, mention that there was some hiccups along the way. There were some problems and sometimes some disasters, but those typically happened early on in their in their journey of, of adopting these practices. So that, so they learned and then they, they moved on and, and improved. It's a, the, I think it's worth mentioning that the, it takes a really high level manager. Almost all of these growers that we talked to were just, you know, they were just excellent managers. So this isn't something that you want to take on without either you having the management skills or you better have somebody in your back pocket. Can, and that's, I think that's like what we'd like to say to Goro. We're right. there to help growers adopt these practices. Don't make the same mistakes that somebody else has made. Yeah. I, I was going to say, you know, if, if you're a little uneasy or you don't feel you have the knowledge or qualifications, I mean, that's what a, a Goro Carbon Alliance is. All of the agronomists and scientists like you are here to help. Right. Yeah. To, we, you, you've seen the hiccups, you've seen um, the the failures, and you can help maybe not eliminate all of the hiccups, but you can absolutely, um, you know, maybe jumpstart and get them closer to uh, the finish line faster without, without as many issues. Right. For sure. So John, as you were conducting these interviews with the economist who, who loves to talk about money and profits and, and uh, how things work, what did you find out on the economic side from these interviews? Yep. So, uh, the, the on average so of these hundred farmers now the the corn in their corn systems they they saw about a fifty one fifty dollar an acre increase in net profit. Wow! And it was about forty five dollars an acre in increase for soybean production in the in that part of the of the production system. So yeah, the, the, those are not small numbers. Yeah. When you start mu- multiplying that across two thousand acres, like it becomes rather significant. When you're when you're considering the costs to adopt these practices. Um, how long does it take to pay back uh, the the costs to implement the changes with that right. kind of a huge um, profit? Right. So what you need to start seeing is so it's probably two to three years. Uh, because oh, good. When you plant cover crops, I mean, there's additional cost of, with that cover crop seed itself. Yeah. Some additional practices, but then you start to see these these agronomic benefits accrue over time. Uh, and, and we can talk about those a little bit, you know, down the road here. What what are those benefits uh, that result in yield increases and, and things like that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you can get a, a return in two to three years in a normal business, that's outstanding. If you can get a return in two to three years in ag, that's incredible. So it seems like uh, it's it's a no brainer if you're doing it right. Right. Well, so one one of the things that we heard them say is uh, about seventy percent of these growers indicated that they saw a yield increase. Oh yeah. And again, it and again, it wasn't right away. Um, it's sometimes like if they were making a switch from till you know conventional till to no till. Again, it just takes some time for the soil to kind of adapt to the to the tillage practices. And so there's a little there sometimes can be a little bit of a yield drag. In the same way, if they don't manage their cover cropping correctly. Um, then, then you start to see you, you, you can have some challenges there. But again, at the very most, probably five years where they would start to see, you know, these yield increases take place. And so, yeah, there, there's a level of patience required in this practice. And again, I think part of Agoro's strategy here is to help we provide some some capital to help offset some of those upfront costs so that in four or five years, when they see these agronomic benefits, why that they they've been they've been able to adopt the practices because of the of the some of the incentives that we provide. Yeah, I think that's that's great. Um, what are the kind of benefits do they do they see by adopting this these practices besides uh, the increased yields, yep. uh, the return on investment over um, you know a, a short amount of time? What other what other positive impacts do they have? Right. So one of the things that they did say is like for the corn production again. They they reduced production costs by twenty four dollars an acre. Wow! And that was maybe that was maybe a little less fertilizer. The the cover cropping system sometimes if you're using legumes for example you mm-hmm. can reduce you can reduce some of your fertilizer rate costs. You can reduce uh, if they're if they're using cover crops oftentimes there's less weed pressure and so they'll reduce the number of weed uh, herbicide applications. Sometimes there are some issues they can solve some issues around pest management. And so all those things when you put them all together. Of course, when you're when you're reducing tillage, you're burning less diesel fuel. 
So right, right away, right away, that's a pretty simple no brainer thing to do is, you know, you run fewer trips across the field. Oftentimes, a lot of them said, uh, we can farm more acres now because I don't have to spend my time on a tractor tilling the ground, the, the heck out of that ground. So all, all those were all comments that we came back and heard from them. So at the end of the day, part of the reason that they saw an increase in profitability is because they saw some yield increases and then they also reduced some production costs. So when you put those together, why that's kind of where they, they improved their profitability. Boy, that's the, the, the sound a banker loves to hear reducing expenses and increasing profit. Yep. You know, it recently, um, we're recording this, um, in the middle of August and we recently, had this devastating fire that went through Maui and we see on the news all the time, this, these extreme weather patterns. Is there a positive impact to these practices as we're looking at more extreme weather patterns? Yeah. As a matter of fact, Scott, that one of the questions we asked in our survey, our interview process mm-hmm. was, do you, do you perceive these practices improving the resilience of your operation, your soils, if, if you will? And I think it was nine out of 10 of the growers said yes. Oh, great. So, so that's like, a, and, and if you, if you think about what uh, these practices do, they add more carbon, organic matter, more carbon to the soil and carbon's basically like the glue that holds soil particles together. So you have these really, if, if you can glue particles together and make them bigger particles, then you got more pore space. And then uh, that allows water to infiltrate faster. Right. In fact, several of them, several of them showed, shared with me images of pictures where they had been at, after a big rainstorm. They were they went out driving around, grabbed some pictures from uh, cover crop fields, and, and there, across the road or across the ditch was a farmer that was bare bare ground, and you know it was just muddy water coming off of the the bare ground. It was just nice clean water coming off the cover cropping. So, so all those things come together to, to definitely you can capture more water. There was a grower that showed us some pictures. This was in Southern Illinois where he had been doing cover cropping. He had strips of cover crops and no cover crops. And so he had a nice drone picture. I mean, the difference in height of the, this was, this was in, he took some pictures of the drone in late August uh, during a drought period in the corn where the cover crops had been growing was like a foot taller and were compared to where the, where they had not grown cover crops. And so that extra water that he caught with those cover crops basically got that, that crop through those August hot spill. And, his, I think he said the yield difference between the cover crop and no cover cover cropping was 20 bushels. Wow. So, so that, I mean, I guess if, if you want to say resilience, why well, that's probably a pretty good example of, of being a more resilient. So this farmer has been on a lot of programs. He's been speakers at a lot of uh, national events. Uh, yeah. Nice. And I would assume most of these uh, farmers are growing um, crops where they're not irrigating, right? So they're reliant on the, the natural rains. That's true. Although we did interview some growers here in the state of Nebraska, where it's there's a fair amount of irrigation, and they saw similar effects. I mean, oftentimes they could perhaps reduce uh, an irrigation event okay. by by not by not tilling or or using some cover cropping to catch and store more water. So um, yeah, because you think about the the aquifers that we're in the United the U.S. Like right? they're you know they're under some stress too, and so anything we can do to to help them keep sustain those aquifers into the future is going to be important, right. important management practice. As you were um, developing these questions, I'm sure that you had some insight or some opinions on how these farmers were going to answer. Um, were there any surprises that you found uh, as you were going through the interview process? Any, any aha moments where you thought, wow, I didn't think that was going to really be the case. You know, I, I think Archie and I maybe wondered about this whole cover cropping thing, uh-huh. and 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 the fact that they they really talked about it as being a very positive thing. Maybe it was a little bit of a surprise. Some of these growers were talking about eliminating totally the the application of herbicides, and so these folks were being able to plant non-GMO corn varieties, non-GMO soybean varieties, and so that those are the kind of kind of things that after they've implemented these practices, that I think I guess I hadn't thought about. It before. And so that was probably a surprise for me as an agronomist. Yeah. So you grew up on a farm, uh, in, in, in Nebraska, uh, you spent your whole career in agriculture. Um, I, I, are, are you farming now? I am not. No, I've got some family members. Actually the fa- farm that I grew up on is, is farmed by one of my cousins. So yeah. 
every now and then I get out there to, to check things out. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, so you, you have some family that is still farming the family uh, farm. What do you recommend to them? Yeah. You know, and, and I've actually, I've, I've talked to this cousin about this and he's actually, I've, uh, we've talked a little about the cover cropping, uh, using the cover crops and actually several of these grow- farmers that are in the area where I grew up in are starting to use this. I, I grew up in a, area that's has a lot of topography a lot of uh, terrain and so uh back when i was farming there we we sent a lot of that soil down the mississippi river (laughs) you lost all that good topsoil we did we did and so i think they're all cognizant of that they know that keeping topsoil there is is important because they 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 can see that where that soil's at the bottom of the Mm -hmm. hill that the corn the corn and the soybean grows much better and so if they can keep that on the top of the hill why then this is something they want to do. So I think uh, these like cover cropping and things like that, there's, they, they recognize that it costs additional money. They also recognize that it takes some time to see these benefits. But uh, uh, the story that I've always told them is that don't try this, these, the, these practices on all your acres, but just test them out and kind of fine tune them so that you don't make a grand mistake on a, on a, on a grand scale. And so that's the, that's the advice I've told them. Uh, uh, the stories that I've heard from talking to these other farmers, I've, I I believe what they've told me because, I, again, back to what we said earlier, they wouldn't have been doing these practices for the amount of time they've done if, if it was costing them money <laughs> and it wasn't improving their operations. So. Yeah, you don't continue to bang your head against the wall for five years and expect uh, your, your headache to go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the, one of the challenges I think for – growers that want to do this is sometimes they rent land uh-huh. and the, and the, and the owner, they, they may not have that land in two or three years. And so they're, if they aren't going to see benefits until two, year two or three and the, and the rent and the landlord all of a sudden says, I'm going to, I'm going to give this to somebody else. Why? But then they're not willing to make that investment and you, and you can understand why they wouldn't want to do that. So to me, that's, there's a, that's causing a lot of the, the, the pushback and, and the reluctance to adopting these practices. If these growers all own the land, I think they would be make, making a little bit different decisions. So, I think it's I think it's uh, it's important for us to reach out to some of the uh, people who manage land for these these uh, tent, tent these landlords, yeah. so to speak, and and convince them that these practices are going to be beneficial because the property their property value is going to increase when their soil their soils are have improved. Yeah, I was going to, uh, that's a great, great point that you, you bring up. I, I live in California where there is a lot of that, where there's family land that is in, has been with the family for, for generations, but they don't want to farm. And so there's a lot of land for rent. Um, and, and sometimes the capital improvements that a, a manager wants to make, um, there's some, a little more risk involved because you may not be able to get a, a renewed lease. Do you know of any, any um, a, as you talk to growers around, are there any good examples of where the, the land owner and the manager have worked well together to, to make these changes and, and improved not only the profitability of the crops coming off the land, but the value increase over time? Yeah, um, we heard stories of some of these growers that we talked to, Archie and I talked to, that actually were able to get more lease land because of what they were doing. So it, it, again, I think it's kind of a it's it's a, it's on the soil health community to get out there and educate the public because I think I heard a statistic that in Iowa, for example, fifty percent of the acres in Iowa are leased acres. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a lot of acres, and there's probably a lot of those folks living in urban areas that have been not very connected to agriculture for a lot of years. And so they perhaps don't know that it's not, it's, I guess it's on incumbent upon the ag industry to educate these folks. You know, as we're talking about this, John, I'm, I'm reminded of an episode we did with uh, Frank Rademacher. And I think, did he participate in this, uh, this survey that you did? Yeah, he was one of the growers uh, that we interviewed in the process. Yeah. Very, very bright young man, really enthusiastic. It was just enjoyed to listen to him talk. Actually, I, I actually met him in person. That was before the COVID thing. So it was really great to sit down and listen to Frank tell his story. If you want to learn more about what he did specifically on his farm, um, we'll link that episode, that, that past episode that we, um, where we talked to him 
in the show notes. So if you want to click over and, and, and hear directly from a farmer who implemented some of these strategies, very forward thinking, very good manager, just a really good interview. If someone wants to learn more about this um, um, survey that you did and see the results and, and really dive into some of the results, where, where can they go to find out more? Right, Scott. So we actually have a link on our, our Goro Carbon Knowledge Hub uh, page where we it's linked to the, the Soil Health Institute's website. And so you can see all the, we actually, there were some videos and recordings oh. that were, that were post, posted there on that website, along with some, some downloadable kind of highlights of the, of the study. So it was broken down by geographies within the Corn Belt. And so it's, it's very granular. And then it's all the way up to very summarized information at the website there. Oh, that sounds like a great way to spend the afternoon is, uh, <laughs> there you, go. you know, get, get the high level view and then drill down to your, you know, somebody that was close to you and listen to their 15 minute, uh, summary interview. We'll make sure that, it, you know, if you didn't catch all that, we'll make sure that that link is also in the show notes where you can, uh, uh, just click on that and go to the knowledge hub that, uh, uh, our website is just just phenomenal. If you ever have any questions, if you're having any um, hesitation, go to the Knowledge Hub. There's a lot of information there. If there's a question that you have, it's probably answered on the Knowledge Hub. And then more importantly, you have contact to real live agronomists and good scientists like uh, Dr. Shanahan that are available for you to, to answer those questions and to help you hold your hand through this process. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about it, that all of these practices do help um, with not only the farm ROI, but the overall health of the soil, which is something that elongates or, or is sustainable over time. And uh, we really, we're real excited to, to share what we've learned um, with you. If you have any other questions, feel free to go to agorocarbonalliance.com. You've been listening to the Agoro Carbon Farming Podcast, where we bring you knowledge on how to sustainably and profitably transform farming through carbon cropping. To learn more about how you can become a partner, visit us at agorocarbonalliance.com or follow us on our many social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn.